Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Power for Today Prophetic Ministries with George Dello and our Tuesday night Bible study. And we want to thank you for joining us on Facebook Live as well as free conference call as we look into the word. And we've been doing a study on the dunamis power of God, God's power to make us into a glorious church and a holy bride that is watching and waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And and the uh, last couple of weeks, we, we've been looking at how the nature of sin opens the door to demonic activity. And uh, we, we did uh, several uh, uh, weeks on dealing with Satan, uh, how it gets uh, affects the church, how it affects our individual lives, and how we have victory over him. And again, uh, it all comes down to you have to do something with the sin nature. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came us to set us free. And when he sets us free, we're free indeed. And uh, when we're free indeed, then the enemy has nothing in us the same way that he had nothing in Jesus. So tonight we're going to continue. And uh, we're looking at uh, under this uh, uh, topic of the dunamis power of God. One of the subtopics we're looking at is another gospel. What brings these things about? How do these, how do these uh, doctrines of demons get into the church? Uh, how do they affect us? And uh, again, as we saw the last few weeks, it opens the door to Satan. But another thing that we want to look at tonight is how it not only opens the door to Satan, but it also quenches the presence of God. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, things have changed drastically uh, in the modern day church over the years that I've been in the church. I, I remember back in the 70s, the 80s. Um, I mean, we expected God to show up when we went to church. We expected God to be there. We went out on the streets and and uh, witnesses witnessed, and uh, we go into the into the inner city and and uh, minister to people. We expected God to show up and uh, move in His power, and He did over and over again. We saw many miracles take place, and uh, among homeless people, uh, street people, uh, and as well as in the church. Uh, we went to church. We expected God to to come by His Holy Spirit and power. And we 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 would have prophecies. We'd have people healed. We'd have people set free and delivered. Uh, when we look at the modern day church today, um, we don't see much of the operation of God. It's few and far in between. In fact, I, I I've been in many churches that don't even bother praying for the sick. That don't even. Uh, have an expectation of God showing up in power and demonstration and uh, uh, doing those things. And so um, one of the reasons I believe we've gotten, that has gotten us into this place is because we have left the foundations of, of true Christianity. And uh, many, many people in the church today have gotten into what we call another gospel. Paul talks about another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. Uh, that comes through false prophets, false teachers, and and uh, people that uh, are used, as we saw, uh, when we open the door to Satan, he comes in and does what? He uses us to do his dirty work. He, he takes us captive to do his will. What is the, the will of Satan? Uh, well, we talked about that as well, that he, he wants to rule and reign upon this earth. He wants to be worshipped. And uh, so he's at war. He's waging war against anybody that worships God or has a testimony of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're seeing uh, happening. And when we open that door again, uh, not only do we give place to Satan, but we are quenching the presence and power of God, which we so desperately need in these days that we're living in. So before we get into the word tonight, let's just take a moment and uh, let's have a word of prayer and uh, go to the Lord and ask him to come and open up the word to us. Father, we just want to thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness in the land of the living. We thank you, Father God, for your mercies that are new every morning, your abundant grace that you pour upon us each and every day. Father God, as we look at the world around us and what is going on, not just in the world, but in the church, we desperately need you, Lord, to pour out your spirit. We desperately need you to restore your presence and power back into the midst of the church. We, we, we need your fire. We need excitement, the presence, the power, the glory, the supernatural. Lord, that should be the normal church. And I pray, Lord, that we get back to that. But we also know that uh, in order for that to happen, we have to restore the foundations of righteousness and justice. We have to get back to the basics and uh, restore uh, uh, your, your righteousness in our midst, that uh, 
uh, we don't give place to the devil. We don't open the door uh, through sin uh, to allow these things to happen. But Lord, we embrace the full redemptive work of Christ and walk in that fullness so that we can uh, uh, see the demonstration of your spirit in our midst in Jesus' mighty name. So Father God, we thank you. And uh, for those of you on Facebook Live, uh, I'm sorry that I, I was interrupted on the, the uh, internet, just uh, went out and came back. So uh, you might have missed a little bit of that prayer. But let's get into the word tonight. And uh, I, I want us to look at, again, uh, the last few weeks, we've seen how uh, when we have people, and, and again, we, we've got many, many people in the church today that are walking after the lust of the flesh. When we give place to, to sin and flesh, we open the door to our enemy, Satan, and uh, bring about de uh, demonic activity in the church. And as we've seen in the scriptures, that, that flesh, that, that sin nature is a nature of lawlessness. It's a nature of darkness. It's a nature of idolatry and enmity towards God, which is basically equivalent to unbelief. You, you can't separate uh, uh, sin and unbelief. They go hand in hand the same way that faith and, uh, uh, and obedience go hand in hand. Because if you really believe who God is, you're going to do what God says do. Amen. And when you don't really believe, uh, then you do as you will. And uh, you can see the connection there. God speaks about it in Hebrews uh, chapter 3 and 4 with Israel. On one hand, he says that Israel couldn't go into the promised land because of unbelief. Then he turns right around and says they couldn't go into the promised land because of their disobedience, because they're synonymous. God will not dwell in the midst of flesh, whether it's individually or corporately. Uh, Paul warned us, and let me let me uh, uh, let me pull up my PowerPoint for those of you on Facebook Live, so you can follow along with us. Uh, if you look at Second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter six, uh, beginning in verse fourteen through verse sixteen, notice what Paul warns us: Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, watch what Paul says here: For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with the Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Notice what Paul tells us here. You, <laughs> these, these things are like oil and water. They don't mix. Uh, you, you can't have them together. It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, righteousness and lawlessness uh, cannot dwell together. Communion, uh, uh, there's no communion between light and darkness because they're co two completely different and opposite things. There, there is no accord. There's no agreement uh, of Christ with Belial. Talking about Satan, demons, there is no agreement there. Uh, there, there, there is no uh, accord or, or part, uh, a believer with an unbeliever. That, that's why he warns us about uh, marrying outside the faith. It's going to cause problems. And then he says, what agreement is the temple of God? We are the temple of God. You can't have a temple of God full of idols. God's not going to allow that. He's not going to dwell there in that place. In fact, whenever uh, Israel got into idolatry, what did he do? He left the tabernacle in wilderness. He left the temple of Solomon. He left it desolate because God will not dwell uh, in those things. And that's exactly what I'm talking about when it comes down to uh, when we allow flesh to, to go on in the church, when we allow uh, sin to, to uh, uh, go on without, without dealing with it, not only are we opening the door to, to, to demonic activity, but uh, we are quenching the presence of God because God will not dwell uh, in that place of sin. And so the reality is, as long as we continue in the flesh, we are no different than unbelievers. In fact, I, I was just. Uh, just uh, uh, meditating. That God just put that in my spirit uh, uh, this this past week, and uh, uh, basically about this fact that we have so many people in the church today uh, that are living in just blatant known sin, and uh, and uh, it, it begs the question: If you're living in sin, what makes you different from an unbeliever? What makes you different? Now, you know, I can, I can hear the, the answers. Well, I said a prayer. 
Okay. Okay. So you said a prayer. What makes you different from an unbeliever? Uh, I believe in Jesus Christ. Well, the reality is if you believe in Jesus Christ, then you wouldn't be living in sin. Uh, it's, it's like Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then don't do what I say do? In other words, Jesus challenges us. If I'm really your Lord, that you're going to obey me. You're, you're not going to continue the lust of the flesh. You're not going to continue to walk and live in sin uh, be, be, because I'm your Lord. And uh, if we are, he's not our Lord. If he's not your Lord, he's not your Savior. You can't separate the two. And you, you can go through with a, a whole scenario with that. These people that are in the church that are living in known willful sin believe they're on their way to heaven. I see them all the time. I, I see the way they live, the things they do. They think they're going to heaven. And the reality is they're deceived and uh, they don't have a true relationship with God. That's the danger here. Now, the effect this is that this has on us in the church can be seen in God's attitude toward these things. As we just saw in 2 Corinthians, God does not have fellowship with lawlessness. Okay? Uh, notice what he says in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. It, it, it is that he said to the Ephesians, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. In other words, we all were born in sin. We had a sin nature. Therefore, we lived a life that was that was driven by the lust of our flesh. And, and notice what he says, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we got a lot of people like that in the church today. But notice what he says, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Let me say that again. When you are living a life in the lust of the flesh, you are being controlled by the lust of the flesh, you are by nature a child of God's wrath, just as all of the unbelievers. Okay? You can say what you want. You can think what you want as far as your relationship with God. But if you are living a life under the power of the lust of the flesh, you are still dead in sin and the uncircumcision of your heart, and you are by nature a child of wrath. Why? Because Jesus came to do what? To take away that nature of sin and to give you a new nature of righteousness and holiness so that you would not live that way uh, anymore, okay? So, so uh, Paul makes a direct correlation between those that are walking the lust of the flesh and unbelievers. In other words, you're the same as an unbeliever when you are living a life in the lust of the flesh, okay? God doesn't have fellowship with lawlessness. In fact, we, we've been talking about this a lot lately, that uh, in Matthew chapter 24, one of, the, one of the characteristics of the last days before Jesus comes, he tells us would be a, a culture of lawlessness. And that's what we're seeing, not just in the world, but is getting more and more into the church uh, as well. And so God doesn't have fellowship with lawlessness. And if you're living on the lust of the flesh, that's called lawlessness. Lawlessness is sin. Okay? They're, they're, they're synonymous. In fact, 1 John tells us lawlessness is sin. Okay? God doesn't have communion with darkness. You can't be living in the darkness of sin and think that you're having fellowship or communion with a holy God, a God who is light and in whom there is no darkness. Again, just go read 1 John chapter 1 and see what John tells us. There is no pact between Christ and the devil. As we talked about the last few weeks, if you if you are living uh, under the power of sin, then you open the door to be used by Satan as an instrument in his hands to use you to fulfill his, his will and purpose rather than God's. And so uh, you, you, can't, you can't play both sides. You can't play with the devil and, and then claim to have Christ as well because they don't go together just like oil and water don't mix. Christ doesn't mix with the devil. It's one or the other, okay? There's no commonality between belief and unbelief. There's no agreement between God's temple and idolatry. And again, the sin nature is rooted in pride, okay? Uh, uh, 1 John chapter 2 tells us uh, it, 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 that pride, which is the uh, very source of all sin, 
is manifested in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So when you are living in the lust of your flesh, you are living in pride, and that's called idolatry. And the Bible tells us, Paul tells us right here in 2 Corinthians, uh, there is, there is uh, no agreement between God's temple and that we're that temple and idolatry. You cannot have idolatry in this temple. You need to pray, God, keep me from idols. And, and again, Paul relates all of this to us as the, the temple of the living God. You can't live a double life. You, you can't serve God and Satan. You can't do. There, 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 there's no agreement in any of this. It's like uh, uh, Amos put it in uh, Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Notice he says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Okay? If you're living in sin, God's not in agreement with you. God is holy. God is righteous. In order to walk together with God, we have to be of the same character, the same nature, the same mind as God. God doesn't, come, does, doesn't uh, lower himself to our standard of sin. He calls us up to his standard of righteousness. That's why he tells us, be righteous because I, or rather, be, whole, be holy because I am holy. Okay? That's what he's talking about. If you, we're going to walk together with God, we have to be like God. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. And that's what this whole, this whole series is about, the dunamis power of God, God's miracle working power to make us holy so that we can walk together with God and have that agreement with him. Now, as long as we continue to tolerate this sin nature, the presence and power of God in our midst is going to be greatly diminished. And you can see this throughout all the scriptures, from the Garden of Eden to the tabernacle in the wilderness with Moses to the Temple of Solomon to, to the Temple of Believers in, the, in, in, in the Revelation. God requires a holy habitation for his dwelling place. And whenever you have sin and idolatry pervade the temple of God, he leaves, okay? Let me just give you one scripture as an example of what I'm talking about. In Psalms chapter 78, verse 58 through 60, notice what he says. For they provoked him to, ha to anger with their high places. That's called idolatry. They are worshiping demons. And moved him to jealousy with their carved images. When God heard this, he was furious and greatly abhorred Israel so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had placed among men. He's talking about the tabernacle of Moses that took them through the wilderness. When Israel went into idolatry, God forsook. In other words, God left it desolate. He took his presence, his power, the cloud by day, the fire by night, and he left that tabernacle desolate, no more presence, no more power, okay? Why? Because God will not abide in the midst of sin and idolatry. And again, he did the same thing with Israel after they moved into the promised land and they, uh, Solomon built the temple unto God. After Israel sinned again, the same thing happened. God left the temple because he's not going to, to dwell in a place like that. In fact, when Christ died on the cross and, and the, the, the uh, veil was rent in two from the top to the bottom, what did they find when the veil was, was ripped apart? Nobody was there. Nobody was there. It was empty. Nobody was there. Why? Because of the sin and idolatry of Israel. And if we think that God who never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hates sin and loves righteousness. That never changes. The law of God is that the wages of sin is death, okay? That never changes. That is an immutable law of God, okay? So if you think that you, as a temple of God, can be like Israel and live in sin and idolatry, and God's going to dwell in you, you better go read the Bible. You better get in the Word. You better repent and call upon God to, to, to save you and to help you because uh, as Jesus talks about, uh, just read the seven letters to the seven churches in, uh, in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, and you'll see he's talking to the church and those in the church that had gotten into sin. Uh, God, uh, Jesus told them either repent 
uh, or, or you're not getting to the kingdom of God. It's that simple. Okay? It's no different today. In fact, the, one of the most devastating effects of the sin nature is the quenching of God's presence and power, both within us as a temple of God, but also within the corporate church. Remember, uh, if you read Ephes Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we, not, we are not only the temple of God individually, but the corporate church is also being built up into a temple uh, for the dwelling of God so that God not only dwells us individually, but he walks among us in his church. He dwells in the corporate church uh, by his spirit and walks among us, okay? Now, this is not to say that God hasn't been moving in his people. We've seen, we've seen a lot of great visitations of the Lord over the years. But, but that's just it. They're, they're just visitations. And we need to understand God's purpose is not to visit us every now and then. God is looking for an abiding place for his glory. God wants a place to rest with his glory. That's been his, his desire from the beginning of creation, that he wants to dwell among his people. That's why he was in the Garden of Eden. He walked with Adam and Eve. He talked with Adam and Eve. He, he dwelt with him. He spoke to them. He, he was there present with him. That's always been God's purpose. That's why, again, when he, when he went uh, after the fall of Adam and Eve and, and God began his redemptive purpose to bring reconciliation uh, to a people, and he called Israel out of Egypt to be that people, what did he do? He, he brought them out of Egypt. He delivered them. He brought them to himself, took them up to uh, Mount Sinai, and that's where God entered into covenant with his people. And what did he establish with Israel? He wanted to establish an intimate relationship with him that they would hear his voice, they would follow his voice, listen to his voice, obey his voice. God would be their God, they would be his people. And so God had them build the tabernacle for that very purpose, that God could dwell with them. And because again, they didn't have any way to, to deal with the sin nature that was within them, uh, God had to have them to build this tabernacle where there was a holy place and a holy of holies. And God would dwell in that holy of holies over the Ark of the Covenant and uh, speak with Israel from there. And then again, uh, his manifest presence was there as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night uh, that all the people knew that God was there. Okay? The purpose uh, of, of visitation is to awaken us to righteousness so that we can become his holy habitation. That's what revival is. And that's why we desperately need revival in the church today. We need a revival to get us back to the basics, back to the foundational doctrines of the gospel of Jesus Christ, back to the, the full and complete redemptive work of Christ where the Son sets us free completely and totally from sin. He makes us into a new creation. He, he removes the, the sinful heart of stone, gives us a brand new heart, a brand new nature, a brand new spirit, and then inhabits us by his Holy Spirit in order to do what? So that we can obey him. We can walk in righteousness. We can live in righteousness. Because again, God wants a holy habitation. But just like Israel, we have thwarted the purpose of God by keep reverting to the flesh in the midst of his visitation. In fact, pretty much every move of God in, in, in the uh, uh, 20, uh, 20th century has really been quenched after it got going by the manifestation of flesh. And, 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 and it was stopped. The move stopped. Because men got it, put got their hand in it. You go back to Azusa Street. God showed up in power. People were getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, the, the, the division was lifted. I mean, blacks and whites were coming together uh, in church when it wasn't allowed to be done that way, and and worship together. And the Holy Spirit was falling upon all of them. Okay, but what happened? Well, flesh got in it, and and racism got in it, and so it died. And you can go through, you can look at uh, uh, Brownsville. You, you can look at uh, uh, the one in Kansas City. You can look at the one in Toronto, Ohio, uh, uh, Toronto, uh, uh, Canada. That's because I live in Toronto, Ohio. Toronto, uh, 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 Canada. We, we've had these moves of God where he comes in power. People are getting healed. People are getting saved. People are getting delivered. And in every single one of them, they stopped, they ended. God withdrew his presence and power. Why? Because flesh rose up and got in it. Uh, they began to commercialize it. People were selling uh, all kinds of stuff. And it was just like when, 
Jesus went to the temple and they, they all these people were selling stuff. Jesus made a whip and had to drive them out. Well, what did we do? We went and did the same thing. People were going out and commercializing these moves of God for their own uh, glory, for, for making money and all this stuff. And that's what killed every one of these moves uh, that came about in the 20th century. God wants to bring a revival that's going to bring us to a place of holiness in reality so that God can dwell with us and he can, uh, he can bring an awakening to our nations and have a holy church where those souls uh, can go and be saved. Now, this really hit home with me in the aftermath of September 11th when we had those terrorist attacks on the U.S. In fact, we just recently uh, 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 marked 20 years since that happened. That's hard to believe for me. It's been 20 years since, uh, since that. Uh, but um, but 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 when that was was happening, uh, it, it, this this whole thing about the presence and power of God and and uh, leaving the church because of the things that are going on in the church uh, really hit me. In fact, uh, the Barner Research Group, which does various surveys uh, dealing with the Christianity in the church, they conducted a survey a couple of months after the attacks uh, on 9/11. And one of the headlines of the report said it all. Churches missed amazing opportunity of terrorist strikes. Churches missed amazing opportunity of terrorist strikes. You see, what happened was the report showed that uh, right after those attacks, millions of people went to church for the first time. Millions of people turned to the church after seven, September 11. And, and, and the report said this. Few of them experienced anything that was sufficiently life-changing to capture their attention and their allegiance. In other words, although this tragic event of a September 11th had moved multitudes of lost people throughout the United States to go to church, they didn't find anything there to affect them in a sufficiently spiritual way for them to return again. So according to, to uh, uh, Barna, Although newcomers appreciated, you know, moments of comfort they had experienced, they had been unaware of anything sufficiently unique or beneficial as to redesign their lifestyle to integrate a deeper level of spiritual involvement. I mean, what an indictment against the American church of Jesus Christ. And, but the reality is, it's true, because we have replaced the true gospel of righteousness and holiness with this carnal gospel that is rooted in lust. It's based on the exaltation of self. I mean, the gospel of comfort, entertainment, pleasure. I mean, you name it. Uh, we went through uh, 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 times of, of, of prosperity gospel, and uh, you know, uh, all these all these different uh, focuses that we had on a better life and how to make a lot of money, how to how to have a, a big business, you know. And basically what we've done is we have quenched the true presence and power of God in our midst. And in doing so, we have presented sinners a gospel. We have, we have shown them a gospel that is powerless to meet their deepest needs. And, and, and what is that deepest need that every single person has? What are they looking for? It's liberation from, the, from their sin. People are bound to sin. That's what Jesus was talking about, John uh, chapter 8. You know, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And what does that sin do? It brings uh, uh, death, every form of death, of, of problems and issues and, and all kinds of stuff. And, and without somebody dealing with that sin, we've done nothing for them. And, and so we've, we, what we've done is we've settled for a gospel that attracts people to Jesus without true repentance. I don't know how many times I've heard uh, uh, altar calls and, and, and the, the minister get up there and, and lead them in prayer. And, uh, you know, Jesus loves you and just say this prayer, just squeeze my hand, just repeat after me. No repentance, no, no, no turning from sin, no, no understanding of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that, that faith in Christ is all about uh, understanding that Jesus came to deliver us from sin, to take away, wash us clean, and make us new creations in Christ that now live and, and walk in newness of life. And so what we've done is we've created this church that is hardened 
to the sin and idolatry that remains within. A couple of weeks ago, I shared this survey uh, that I found talking about the upcoming generations and the things that they believe. And that was one of the areas that so many of these young people coming to the church today uh, don't, don't, don't get. They believe it's okay to live together uh, without the benefit of marriage. They believe it's okay to fornicate with one another. They believe it's okay to uh, carry on in, 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 uh, with unclean spirits and, you know, all these things. You, there was a whole list that, uh, that they basically, they do not believe that these things are sin a- anymore. And, and so let me ask you, uh, what's the point of Christianity if it doesn't have the power to change us? What's better about this new covenant if we're still enslaved to the power of sin and death? Because remember, again, you can't change the law of God. Sin produces spiritual death and physical death as well, but ultimately spiritual death, that second death from which there is no return. It's the lake of fire. And and, and so if 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 we are not presenting a gospel that has the power to deliver people from sin, where does that leave them? And well, all you've got to do is look at the church today and we can see where it leaves them. It leaves them in this mess. It leaves them in a condition uh, of, of uh, sinfulness whereby they are being used by the enemy, by the devil, to bring division and strife and all kinds of stuff into the church as instruments in his hands but also it is resulting in the lack of God's presence and power in the modern day church to where we do not see uh, the power of God the way we are. Listen, much of what we call church today has little to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's gotten to the place that is built on the exaltation of self rather than the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And, and, and one of the biggest areas that this is true in is not just the, the pride that, that he talks about the idolatry, the pride, uh, again, which is the, the root of the lust of the eyes, the lust of flesh, and the pride of life that's in the congregation. But it's in the leadership of the church today. I, I mean, some of these, some of these uh, church leaders you run into today, uh, I, I mean, they, 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 <laughs> some of the stuff they, they dress in and, and the way they, they carry themselves like they are you know, six stories above everybody else that nobody can approach them. Uh, I mean, I've seen it so bad where uh, 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 we tried to to uh, speak with this pastor. He's surrounded by two or three people and asked if we could have some time to 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 talk about some things. And he reaches behind him with, with his hand and uh, somebody slips him a card and he gives that card to us like, you know, go and make an appointment and that maybe maybe I can fit you in somewhere. Uh, you can go on and on and on, but this is what we've done. Uh, pride has gotten into the church. And uh, uh, again, it's the very root of everything that's going on. And this is what the people of Genesis did, the plains of uh, Shinar, when they built the Tablet of Babel. What did they say? Come and let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. Let me read it differently. Come and let us build ourselves a church, a a church whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. You see, that's what we're doing. I mean, churches are in competition with each other when we ought to be working together for the because we work for the same Lord. I hope. I hope we are. And we're all about the same business of seeking to save that which is lost. But but you can't get churches to work together. You can't get churches and pastors to pray together. You can't get them to come together and uh, 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 help each other. It's extremely hard. I've been I listen. I have been involved in uh, 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 pastors, uh, groups of pastors coming together uh, since way back in the early '80s, uh, all the way up to today. Uh, I've, I've, I've gone out, I've found uh, where, where, you know, we, we come into times where uh, somebody would, would uh, call pastors together that we really need to pray. We really need to spend time to, to fellowship and to work together. And, you know, 
uh, in the beginning, you go around, you exhort everybody because of the conditions that were going on. The first meeting, you get a whole bunch of pastors come together, and from there, it's downhill until you end up with a little, a little tiny group of a few, and you're right back where you are again. And, and that's happened all this time. And uh, again, because of this self-promotion, this this self thing that you know my name's not on the on the sign and all this different stuff. It's just nothing but pride. Okay, how different are we today? As we strive, we got to have the biggest buildings, draw the largest crowds, gain the best reputation, and pretty much, you know, what are we doing? Trying to make ourselves God on this earth. We're no different than the Tower of Babel people. Our focus has become all about making the most money, praying, uh, praying in and getting the biggest houses, the best cars, and naming and claiming the world's goods. Meanwhile, people are going to hell all around us. Meanwhile, we've got people starving to death, Christian people. We got, we got Christians in prison being tortured, being beaten. And here we are over here, you know, all about what can I get bigger and better than the next one? I mean, we got to have names. <laughs> oh, God help us. I, I, you know, it used to be we were pastors. Then everybody started, well, bishops. Then everybody had to be a bishop. So then someone knew this. I got to be better than these people. Then it's apostles. Then everybody's apostles. So next thing you know, we got chief apostles. Then we got on it. There's no end to it because, again, that pride uh, has gotten into the church, into the, the leadership, and nobody is satisfied until they're bigger and better than everybody else. And, and we end up, you know, we, we end up preaching a gospel uh, of blessings and power of God uh, for getting more and more for ourselves. And again, meanwhile, look around us. We <laughs> look around us. We, we got homeless people everywhere. We got poor people everywhere, especially today in, in, in 2020, 2021, going into 2022. I mean, things are getting worse by the day. And we still got churches and pastors that are nothing about how do we get blessed? How do we have more? How, how do we get how do we get bigger and all this nonsense? And then the church services, rather than being about redemption rather than being about transforming lives uh, into uh, a, a glorious church and a holy bride, our church has become designed to make us feel good, tickle our spine, get us excited so we can go home feeling good about ourselves. It's, it, it, everything becomes centered around us and we and our church, our programs, our way, our greatness, our correctness, me, my, mine, what can we get for ourselves? Listen, when's the last time you heard the gospel? Deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. When's the last time you were called in church, the church service, where the, the minister called you to make a real sacrifice of humility and repentance? When's the last time that you came together with the saints for no other purpose than to seek the Lord? or with no expectation for yourself, just to seek him, to worship him, to praise him with all your being, to thank him, to, to just seek God, okay? In fact, when's the last time that your church came together and you just spent that time before you did anything, getting on your faces and praying and seeking God? When's the last time that you waited for the Lord to come into your midst before you took off with all your programs for the day? Peter said this in 1 Peter 4, 2. Peter said this. I think maybe I missed it. There we go. No longer that we that should we no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. That that pretty much sums it up. Peter's telling us what the church should be about. We're not here to live for the lust of the flesh, the lusts of men. We should not be living a life to fulfill the lust of our flesh. We should be living a life to fulfill the will of God. As Paul tells us, we're not our own. We were bought with a price. We are here. We exist for the primary purpose, the sole purpose, to glorify God in our bodies and our spirits. That's what it's all about. And so if we really want to get the presence and power back to God, uh, of God back into the church, if we want to see God move in our churches again, we've got to have revival, and it begins with repentance. 
We've got to get on our face and begin to cry out to God to bring divine visitation again, to, to come and uh, stir us up again, to pour out his spirit again, to bring us uh, back to that place uh, that we are seeking him and his will and his purpose, that we recognize the times that we're living in and we start getting serious uh, about what we ought to be about. Uh, I mean, listen, you got to be blind not to recognize that the Lord's coming soon. I mean, the signs that are happening right now, we we are seeing played out before us the precursor to the tribulation period. We are seeing the spirit of Antichrist being manifested around us like never before. All of these nations are are are, are uh, uh, preparing the, the minds and the 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 minds sets of people for the coming of the Antichrist. The lawlessness, the 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 uh, 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 this tyranny that's taking place, the control, uh, uh, control everything you do, everything you say, every place. I, I mean, you've got to wake up and uh, we need to recognize we are here for such a time as this. And our primary purpose is to seek and save that which is lost. The church needs to get serious and start doing what we were called to do. Jesus tells us in John, we didn't choose him. He chose us. and He chose us for a purpose that we he has appointed us to go and bear fruit, and not just any fruit, but good fruit that will remain. Not just getting people to say a prayer, but bringing people into the full redemptive work of Christ. It's time for the church to wake up, quit getting caught up in this other gospel, this other Jesus, this other spirit. We got to we got to break free from from this this uh, sin that's coming to the church, this lust, this pride that has taken over the church. And we need to become the glorious church, the holy bride, without spot or blemish or any such thing, but to be holy and blameless in the sight of God and get back to our true and divine purpose. Amen. So uh, I'm going to cut this off here because uh, I've got another uh, service coming up here in about 15 minutes, and i got to get ready for that as well. So uh, let's take a moment and pray. And uh, as we pray, ask God to, to, to show you your heart. Ask God to touch you and to speak to you. And if there's an issue there, if you're not living up to the standards that God has called us, ask God to forgive you and to bring about that transformation in your life. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we recognize that the church today is in sad condition. We have opened the door to, to demonic activity. Lord, we have quenched your presence and power, uh, not just now, but over the, the, the last decades, Lord, every time you've tried to move and and uh, bring about a great move of your spirit, a great outpouring upon this earth. Men have stood up and by the flesh and pride have stopped that move. They've quenched the spirit. And so you've had to depart and leave uh, and, and, and put an end to that thing. God, we need a revival in this hour that no man uh, will touch, that no, no man will glory in it. Nobody will touch your glory. That, Father God, you would bring a revival that was so convict us and touch us and change us and transform us, that, Lord, we would not dare, dare, not dare to touch your glory. Uh, but, Lord, we would just give you place to have your way and allow you to do what you need to do so that you could you could prepare that glorious church and prepare a people that will be obedient to you and get about your business. I pray, Father God, that you will do a quick work because there's a lot of tares among the wheat. There's a lot of sin in the church, even in the pulpits. God, I pray that you would clean house. I pray, Lord God, that you would just uh, the light of your countenance, Lord God, would, would reveal every darkness and deal with it, bring conviction, and uh, move upon the hearts and minds of these that are involved in these things to repent and turn back to you, Lord, that you can do a complete and full work through Jesus Christ and his blood that was shed on Calvary. God, I pray that you will move mightily while it is yet day, and raise up labors for the harvest, uh, for the fields are white unto harvest. And Lord, we need workers and laborers throughout the body of Christ to reach this lost generation. So Father God, I just pray that you just open the blinded eyes, break through the darkness of understanding, reveal these things, Lord God, and bring your church into the place it ought to be. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Well, praise God. I want to thank you for being with me today. I I ask that you would just share this video. Uh, this is George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries, coming to you from Toronto, Ohio. Uh, I will be back next Tuesday as we continue in this. Uh, I don't know about you, 
Uh, I want to see God's glory like never before. Uh, I want to see, I, I, I want what, what uh, John Wesley prophesied about. I, I want it to be normal. The fire, the excitement, the presence, the power, the glory, the supernatural be normal in the church of Jesus Christ because it is a glorious church and the holy bride that God is pleased to inhabit, to indwell, to, to manifest himself. I, I pray uh, to, 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 to have that upon this earth uh, that's going to bring in a great harvest of souls because people will be drawn to the power of God. And so uh, we need that very desperately. Amen. Let's continue to pray for revival. We pray for the awakening of our nations, that God would raise up godly leadership in our nations and uh, stretch forth his hand against all this darkness and wickedness taking place uh, in America. Amen. Uh, please pray for my wife uh, going through a lot of uh, difficulties physically, uh, a lot of pain and, and other issues. Uh, please lift her up. We are believing God for a miracle in Jesus' name. Uh, that God will just stretch forth his hand and uh, uh, bring a healing miracle in the name of Jesus. So please pray with me about that. And uh, again, I'll be back uh, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. You can join us for our Sunday morning service next Tuesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we'll be back with uh, the dunamis power of God. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. I pray that you have a, a blessed week. And uh, keep looking up because your redemption draws nigh. We're one day closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you and be with you in Jesus' name. Amen.